We're live. It's it's Monday again. How about, how'd that happen? Another week. Already. Already. It seems like that's just amazing. Oh, yeah. So uh, so hi everybody. Hi everyone. We're glad to see you. We're glad to be back this Monday afternoon. It's uh, it's uh, it's behind the tasting bar. No, 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 no. It's in the cellar with Ken Hardcastle. It should be obvious, shouldn't it? <laughs> we're in the cellar. We're in the cellar. So we're we're in the cellar with Ken Hardcastle uh, this Monday afternoon. Uh, this fine Monday afternoon. What a beautiful day it is out there. And uh, we're going to take a, a couple of minutes here just to, to let everybody catch up and, and uh, join us for this video. And, uh, and we're going to talk about some, some fun stuff today. Um, we are going to talk about quints. And uh, what's a quince? Yeah, exactly. So Ken's going to help us understand what a quince is. Um, but before we do that, just a, a couple things. I want to uh, uh, let everybody know we're really excited. Uh, we just got word that our canned cranberry uh, apple cider is going to be in the New Hampshire liquor stores. We're so excited about that. So be much more widely distributed around the area. Hey, Wolfgang, great, great to see you. <laughs> um, and, and I'm behind the camera right now because we're going to start this segment out by introducing you a ferment of quince. And, and uh, so... Uh, Wolfgang's probably familiar with quince. Jews quite a bit. Yeah, France probably. Elsewhere. So, uh, so we've got, we got four people with us now. Let's wait a few more minutes and get... Uh, Geraldine's watching us. Hi, Geraldine. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, So we're going to get we're going to dig in on the quince in just a minute. Um, but anyway, we're really excited. Our cranberry apple cider is uh, is going to be in the in the liquor store real soon. We don't know we don't have a date yet, but it'll, it'll be sometime in the next few weeks probably. And uh, uh, we're we're still uh, open and have outside eating at the winery because of all this excellent weather. And we've also added when the weather does finally turn, as we know it will. And uh, Ken's all excited, as is Chuck, because that means skiing is that much closer. And, uh, but it will turn. And when it does, uh, we're going to spread people out in the winery by allowing people to sit in our wine cellar on Saturdays and Sundays. So uh, we'll have approximately 16 seats in the cellar where, that are socially distanced from one another. So, uh, but until then, uh, the, the fine weather continues, and we'll, uh, we'll be seeing you on our deck. So... Uh, we're looking forward to that. So I think I've chatted enough. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk today about quince. Hi, Eli. Great, great. You could join us. And John, John O'Brien, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about quince. I'm going to start with just uh, having Ken describe a little history of quince and, uh, and, and tell us a little bit about the fruit and then talk about an active ferment that we have going on here. So Ken, why don't you take it over with, with some quince? Hi, everyone. We're going to talk about this uh, unique fruit that um, grows in New England, has grown here for centuries, and um, grows as well in, in Europe and, and elsewhere. And it's used um, for a number of different things in the culinary world. It's got a, an incredible aroma and um, strong flavor profile. It's, uh, it's very dry. It's, it's almost... Um, it's a bit between the apple and the, <coughs> excuse me, the pear family of fruit. It's hard, rock hard, like a, like a softball. And there are many different types of quince. Some are very small, some are quite large. Um, this is a pineapple quince, I believe, okay. from Allison's Orchard in, in New Hampshire. And um, it has, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little fur on the outside of the fruit. It's, it's a fine, um, almost like an insulation, like fiberglass or something like that. And this fruit creates this, this, this loose fuzz, and it prevents small insects from traveling around on the fruit and, and boring into it. So it's a natural way of preventing pests from getting at it. It's really fascinating. I think I should grow some of that. You, you could, yeah. yeah. Now, is, there, is there also yeast contained within that fuzz? Is that... I, I'm sure there's yeast on the fruit because okay. there's sugar in it, and so it would it would land on it. But the fruit, the fur, as I understand it, is this sort of natural 
deterrent okay. from bugs. It's like putting uh, stuff down in your garden or something like that to keep slugs away, diatoms and things. Yeah. Little small, um, really gets them tangled up. You know, this little this fur is, you know, gigantic things of fiberglass with it when you're a little tiny bug. <laughs> but um, I found out about this fruit from Greg Mead. And Greg has a distillery in New Hampshire and grows all sorts of fantastic fruit. Cold, Cold Garden Spirits. Cold Garden Spirits. In, uh, yeah. in Canterbury, New Hampshire. Canterbury. And uh, Greg makes some wonderful eau de vies and various distillates using quince and a variety of different things that he grows. And when we were first getting involved in, in trying to make wine out of what was growing around here, he was one of the people I reached out to and said, Greg, what do you have, what do you suggest that would, would be good, that grows well around here to make to make wine out of? So, well, you could try it. Quince, he's also the one who turned me on to rose hips. And kiwi berries. And kiwi berries. Mm -hmm. All three of those, that's right. And um, so quince is a, is a real key fruit, and it's in um, a number of our products. We're going to sample those today. I know we're getting thirsty here, and we're going to need to talk about an awful lot pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> could, um, you, could you start us with the, with the cider? Because what what I really liked about learning about the quince in when when I was researching um, hard cider, the way hard cider was made here in the 16, 17, 1800s, it turns out that they were using a variety of apples that are not too familiar to most of us. Um, back then, there weren't Red Delicious or things like that. There were Roxbury Russet and Kingston Black and, and all sorts of unusual, unique. Cider. Apples, yeah. which were primarily for making cider. They also would use quince because of its great aromatic and tangy character. And that's what's in here? And that is in the cider. This is firewood and kittens? Firewood and kittens. Firewood and so kittens. it's always amazing to me when you bring a box of quince into the, into the winery, even if I'm on the floor above you on the other side of the winery, I sometimes know that you had a quince yeah. delivery because of the strong, powerful aroma. The inside of that, it's a beautiful five-fold symmetry inside. Now, most homesteads, as I understand it from, from reading about this, most homesteads in New England in the 1700s, 1800s would have at least one quince tree on the property. And it wasn't necessarily for the hard cider, because there may have been a cidery down the road or, or what have you, but they would also use this fruit to help set their preserves. So this fruit, quince, has a tremendous amount of pectin. Ah, so, so this make, reminds to me. To make strawberries gel up, or to make your, your jam gel up, you would put a little bit of quince in it. Yeah. So this reminds so, me of... People still do. Still do. Yeah. They still do it. But, but, but actually, this is one of the, the reason that quince sort of fell out of favor. Because Knox came up with yeah. gelatin in the early 1900s or late 1800s. Knox Berry Farm grew out of that. And it... It meant we didn't need quince anymore, so it became less and less popular. And since it wasn't something you'd eat off the tree, it really was something you made at home in your home kitchen. It became less and less. You buy a little popular. package of Jello, right, from gelatin, and that was powdered, yeah, deep horseradish or whatever it was. Ooh, no gosh. longer, no longer vegan. So this is an incredibly aromatic yeah, fruit. Tasty. It's very dry, it's sort of punky, dry character. It was delicious. But when you bite it, it's really it's sweeter than I would have thought. There's a, a lot of sugar in this. What? You don't notice that much. It's so dry. Right. I mean, it's just ten. It's like it's it's um bitter's not the right word. I don't know what the right. It's word like ten. It's, it's the dryness you get from ten. It's like sucking like onto your cardboard. It's yeah. just dry. Hmm. But there is a little bit of juice when you when you cut it up with it. You get some of the, the juice that comes out, and it's quite sticky sweet. Mm. Quite a bit of sugar. There's a lot of sugar. It's very sweet. Um, it's delicious. But it's that, that dryness that adds a unique character to to cider. So as I read it, that in the old days, people would use anywhere from 5 to 10% of the fruit going into their cider would be quince. Ah. And so I usually adhere to that. Somewhere around that sort of percentage goes into the cider. So a blend of apples heirloom cider apples go into this as well as the quince. So you ferment the quince 
in the cider itself. Yeah, so the fruit. That's right. So so Chuck Souther at Apple Hill Farm in Concord grows a number of heirloom cider apples. And he is the one that crafts the unfermented heirloom cider for us. And it varies each year, and he chooses the ratios of Yarlington Mill and Ellis Bitter and, and those unique apples that he grows there. He brings that cider here, and then I end up, from you going down to Allison's Orchard, or other people around here that have quince, and I'll chop up this quince and throw it in to the cider. Mm -hmm. That I gives you the like, liquid that you need. And it gives, there's the liquid base, and right. it, um, then that fermentation pulls all the flavor out of that quince. Sometimes I'll add some pears into the ferment as well. Um, so from so my own yard. The firewood in kittens it has up to 10% quince. quince yeah. And then does it have dolgo and then also some... It has crab apples, it has dolgo crab apples. Yeah. And it has other apples added to it. Like the Kingston Blacks. Like the Kingston Blacks. Yeah. 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 And that adds to the complexity of the finished product. It's very unique. Um, distinctive heirloom ciders that are created by these, these heirloom apples are completely different than taking like um, a sweet cider apples or a simple sweet cider that's made from Macintosh or Cortland or some high sugar apple that may taste good, but when you ferment it, it basically turns away, it goes away. There's not much flavor there. It's these very unique, bold, flavorful things that end up creating a product which is light and refreshing and dry, but has this level of complexity to it. So this is all heirloom apple fruit. It's 100% cider from heirloom apples mm -hmm. with more heirloom apples added, added to it. So let's take a look at what we got going on here in this bucket here. So, tell, us, tell us what's happening. So I got excited about this quince. Not only because of its historic use in cider and the flavors and aromas that it brings to the cider. But I also thought it would be a really great wine. Just like we make a wine out of the crab apples that are used in cider, why can't we make a wine out of this? So early on, I started fermenting just the quince itself to see what that flavor profile was like. It's quite intense on its own. And so we don't create and sell a varietal wine based on quince. We blend it into a couple of our products, most notably our Lake House White, which we'll be drinking here shortly. So to make a wine out of the quince, what we do is to, and this is an active fermentation, so this happens once a year. There are four and a half bushels, um, 180 pounds of quince, which um, were fully ripe and yellow like this and, and really unique in flavor. And they were sliced up by this apple slicer and put into some water and some sugar. And so the water in there and the sugar will ferment from the yeast and create a very distinctive, very flavorful and aromatic wine, which will be at about 12 and a half, 13% alcohol. When How long has that been fermenting? This is, um, I did this Friday, so four days. Okay. Three, three and a half, four days. Um, so when a wine ferments, whether it's um, a bunch of uh, Merlot grapes that have been chopped up, the fermentation process, you can see all the bubbles in there. There's carbon dioxide gas that's created, and that tends to float the fruit up to the top push the fruit up to the top. And so to make sure that the fruit stays in contact with the liquid, a couple times a day, you use, use this tool, a punch down tool, to push the fruit back down into the liquid. Now because this has only been going a few days, it hasn't reached its full fermentation activity. And when that happens, this device, you can just set it on the top and it stays on the top. There's like a, a table of compact dry fruit. Cap. It's a cap. It's a serious cap. And it takes some effort to push down through it. This is just starting. 
So it's still kind of loose. But you can see the see all the fruit that's in there. And this fermentation process goes on for about a week and a half for the yeast to convert all of the sugars into alcohol and pull all that flavor out of the fruit. Pretty soon the, the pieces of quince in there don't have much flavor at all. They're sort of tangy from the yeast, but they're not much flavor. All of the flavor has gone into the liquid. And then we'll take a wine press, scoop all this up into the press. The press is a big screen which holds back all the fruit pulp. And there's a bladder inside of which under water pressure expands and squeezes the fruit and squeezes all the wine out, which gets collected. And then that gets blended in with other components to make our lake house white and our Winnipesaukee white, our Winnie white. Did you add these of the yeast to this? I did, yeah. I, um, you know, you can work with the yeast that's on the fruit. Um, I've diluted quite a bit with the water, so that's less yeast per volume of fruit. And different yeast do different things, and in this case, I, I really like this one burgundy strain of yeast, the CY3079, which tends to really bring forward the aromas and flavors of the fruit really nicely. So I use that consistently with all the components in Lake House White. So that's the quince, the rose hips, the peaches, and the rhubarb. Those are all fermented with 3079. Will these turn uh, brown as they oxidize through the ferment? Sometimes they get a little brown on the surface if they're, they're left on the surface for a while. Not as much as the apples. Does that change the flavor? I mean, if you have a, a ferment that has less oxidization, that's the right word, does it, does it change the character? I, of the, I of don't the know. I, I, it might. Um, I know there's some ways that you can work under a blanket of CO2, mm -hmm. continually bleeding CO2 into something when you crush it. Right. And, oh, and right. do all that to prevent it from going brown. So this this is actually kept in CO2. Right now it's, right. yeah, now it's protected. Yeah. But it still browns a little bit. So, so let's, uh, let's, go let's try some of this. Let's get you in here, Bob, and let's, yeah. let's drink some of this quince. Isn't that cider? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know, but maybe it's having uh, eaten some of the quince and then going right to this, this, this uh, firewood and kittens, which is really sort of our... Cheers, cheers, cheers. Everybody out there, like Wolfgang and uh, Eli and... Carolyn and Margaret Ellison's out there watching and Carissa I think joined us. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. You know, Normandy and other parts of France, England, mm -hmm. are really the, the, the heritage, the, the homeland of cider, heirloom ciders, and they're still made, and they're d distinctive and grow. And they grow those heirloom varieties and they craft their, their ciders in a unique historic way. Mm. This is just so cool. It's just such it's a nice just like <laughs> <laughs> mm. It is just really, really good. It's, it's nice really, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't know what the right word is for me with this cider. Is I want to say austere. In other words, it's particular having had some quince to, as my starter with my palate. Have a piece of cheese with it. The, oh, the yeah. flavors, oh, well, that's a great idea. The, uh, the wine really, the, the cider really uh, sticks out as a matter of being very flavorful in a, in a apple, uh, dry apple way. It's not a green apple, it's a rich... Uh, and that's what's what sure what the word there's is. Some, there's there's some more sort of mainstream commercial ciders that I've had at times, and a lot of them are like Granny Smith's or right. apple. Yeah, green or apple, candy apple. apple. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not... That's like what people think of when they bite into a, to a sugary red apple or a green at Granny Smith apple for a pie. But that's not the sorts of apples that go into a cider. An heirloom cider is a completely different thing. It doesn't have, just like you're saying, it doesn't have those green apple smells at all. No, but, uh, but it's a, yeah, it's a style thing, right? I mean, there are, there are people that, that make sweet fruit wines, and, and there's a certain group of people that love them. Oh, and there's yeah. sweet ciders that are, that are very different than this, that, that some people very much enjoy. But this is more of an old fashioned, more of a... Yeah, this is more European style or early American style cider from uh, from, this, mm. from the heirloom type apple. Yeah, it goes really well with this cheddar cheese. Yeah. I have to say it does. I think what's really nice about just like we talked about with other wines that are dry, it pairs better with food than a sweeter. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, that's that's 
that's um, that's one of the most important things about a dry wine. It's, it's an accompaniment. It's so your food. You're going to have food. Yeah. 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 Um, whereas sweet wines tend to be had on their own, um, or with dessert. Like that nice Bordeaux we had. Yeah. At your place with those ribs. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, Chuck was talking about the fruit browning, and I thought these have only been sliced open just a few minutes ago, and already yeah. I significant the browning is happening on the on the fruit, and I, I, uh, I find that interesting. And you don't see it in the, in the fruit that's like, it's in the ferment because it's covered with the CO2. Yeah. What, what's, uh, Wolfgang's making me laugh because he's he's upset that we have this nice plate of. Uh, you just have to come to our uh, deli and order this, and you can have this too, Wolfgang. Uh, he was hungry. <laughs> well, so was Trevor. Why we had it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and now we're now we're taunting him. So now, you know, we should let me get another set of glasses. We should do this, the kids, side by side oh, that's with the good. dessert. Then I'll get some glasses. Okay. Because there are two ciders here, our Firewood Kittens and our Cider Reserve. Both are made from heirloom cider apples, including some quince, some crab apples, uh, depending on the vintage, sometimes some pears. They're fermented dry, but the reserve is fermented in French oak wine barrels and aged in those barrels for a month or two. So it adds a different character to Side. And let's do a side by side. Mm -hmm. we can see what that mm -hmm. Oh, that's good with the salami to his salad, isn't it? You can see they look about the same. Same clear, straw colored. I've never had these two side by side. I don't know that I know either, either, except when they're fermenting or going through the the, the um, filtering or whatever. Yeah. No, I just saw Chuck swirling, and I was swirling mine earlier. Um, but just a reminder: when you're drinking a sparkling beverage. You want to avoid swirling because your swirling is going swirling to away the, the bubbles. swirl away the bubbles more rapidly than you would like. So it's sometimes hard to remember. You're so used to putting a wine in a glass. And well, these are just nice wine glasses. Too. Yeah, they just they just beg to be swirled. Oh, it's it. There's, there's more aromatics on this one. And uh, this is a we do have swirl. slightly different glasses. Yes, yeah, true. So this is a 450 and a 650 mil. They didn't have. You didn't have three of those available, so I couldn't get the same size. They're quite similar, this this vintage. Some vintages are dip, more different than others. Yeah, for me, well, it's... Well, tell us the difference in how they're made. So they're, they're, they're made the same way. They're fermented the same way. Um, it's the same mixture of fruit with the quince and the crab apples. But then the reserve is get the barrel aging component to it. So it tends to smooth it out a bit and give sort of a rounder uh, feel to the, to the wine. And I think that's how I would describe it. Yeah, me too. Softer, it juicier. It is a little softer. Yeah. yeah. Um, it almost has this, this a, a juiciness that's probably because it's not as sharp with the, the bitiness of the, that the kittens have. It's, it's, that, it's been mellowed by that. I think there's, yeah. a, there's a little bit more of a tannic grip on the back end of it. At the finish, yeah, I'm getting that. The finish, mm -hmm. I get that grip. Yep. I okay. bet you the food will here I'll little edge more better with the uh, with the reserve. <laughs> and Wolfgang now thinks we should send him wine so that he can he can open it and make that sound. It could. It'd be good. Well we'll have to see what we There's can probably do. some wine in Provence, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we, might have, we might have to come there and open some wine in, in these uh, I can see a trade deal. I can see it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. You come here, we'll go there. Yeah. We'll pull some corks and compare notes. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I, they're very similar. Mm. They're very similar. And, yeah. I, and I like them both a lot. But I, the, the subtleties that are part of that reserve still is preferable to me. Mm. There was a vintage a couple years ago 
where the batches were made separately at separate times, and there was a bigger difference between the two mm -hmm. because the blends were not exactly the same. This one was the, the blends were the same, so it's just the barrel region yeah. difference. So tell me, we've talked about this, and I think this is accurate. You correct me if it's not, but we've talked about merging these two, right, in the future. We're going to do that actually. Yep. Yeah. So, so it's actually we've been going going round and round. There will be no more reserve. This is the last vintage. Well, and, but, and it's, it's actually a good thing because it's this is really our our you know our first cider. It's our first one. It's our flagship cider. It's the first one we did. It's the one we're we're uh, really the most proud of for for getting us down this down this path. And the reserves kind of was a spin off on that. Uh, along with a couple other ciders. And we realized maybe we should just make the, the kittens the best cider it can be and, and not just have a distinction of a reserve, but make the kittens. Right. So now the kittens are going to be, basically I'm going to have some barrel aging component to the kittens. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So you're going to make, this will be more like the yes, reserve. It'll literally be like these two mixed. There you go. Yeah. Right there. This is the new cider. The new cider. New cider. This will probably be the next year, right? Yeah. There we go. It's fermenting right now, actually. And if you didn't know, um, this is also going to be a good thing for for our local humane society because uh, kittens, uh, five percent of the sale of this goes to help fund the New Hampshire Humane Society. Tell so, people the story behind that because that's kind of unique. Right? So yeah. Really, so this is the first working with with them. Right, so Deb, Deb Bucky, who used to work with my father many, many, many years ago, 30, 35 years ago, and, uh, and I met each other uh, at an event uh, in honor of my father who passed away many years ago, and Deb had, had learned that I was part of a winery, and she said, she said I've always wanted to, to design a label for a winery, and, uh, and I said, well, I'm sure I could help you with that, and so I started thinking about it, and and we'd already had a design, sort of a distinctive design for most of our, our classic wines, but then we were thinking about putting a cider out there, and I knew Deb's style of artwork, and I said, you know, Deb, I think you would be perfect to come up with the design for our, our cider label. And so I just let her go and come up with whatever she thought was, was, uh, was cool. And she came up with our, the first real, yeah, we, we told her a little story about yeah, the, the about vermin, the vermin yeah. and, and why we were making the products we did from local ingredients and all that sort of stuff, and she just ran with it. So yeah, so she comes comes up with this character. That's Joseph Plummer in, in Deb's in Deb's mind, and uh, and as Deb uh, sees a hermit, you often when you drive around the back roads of New Hampshire, you'll see places where hermits live, and they they fought, they advertise firewood and, and kittens for sale, possibly, um, or at least that's uh, that's one version that Deb decided to put on our label. So this is Hermit Art Apple Cider, firewood and kittens for sale. And it goes on to the back to say, Hermit Art Apple Cider makes a fine companion when you want to sit on a stump in the woods alone. It's a lively blend of heirloom sharps, goes, goes just right with fresh air and lots of thinking to do. More sociable types are free to raise a glass with whatever wildlife you choose, the hermit. <laughs> so she started this fun storytelling uh, cider story for and us. And went on to the reserve. Went on to the reserve, hermit hard apple cider reserve, res uh, <coughs> reserve only sold to kind-hearted folks. And you get to determine that for yourself. Hermit hard, hard apple cider reserve is so named because I reserve the right to send some customers away. Okay, yes, I do. <clears throat> I do that primarily by raising the price. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a confident, confrontational guy. Still, I think you self-selected good people will find this barrel-aged blend of heirloom sharps not only nice, but worthy, the hermit. So, uh, and you, there are two other stories on our cranberry apple yep. cider and the blue and, cider. Uh, or blue cider. And uh, so, so when she came up with firewood and kittens, the first thing we decided is we've got to have a, we've got to first of all make this a part of the Humane Society. We all love kittens. Who yeah. doesn't love kittens? So uh, on the release of this, we had an event, 2015. 
where we actually had firewood and kittens for sale. Yeah. We didn't sell a stick of firewood, I don't know what happened there, but we did find homes for 20 or so, or I don't know, maybe not that many, but a bunch of kittens from the Humane Society, and we raised some money for them as well. And we continue to raise money through the sale of this one, so it's been a great story. Deb Lucky's a great person, she's, uh, she's a, also an author of children's books. If you're interested, she, uh, she authored two books, uh, a series, called The Lunch Witch, the Lunch Witch. and uh, I believe, I don't know if it's, it, uh, I'm not sure the timing on this, but I believe it's also scheduled to be made into a children's story on television, so uh, keep your eye open for The Lunch Witch. And, and uh, she's the, the one that is designing our labels for our cans. Yes, that's All right. these wonderful, unique story book-like things on a cranberry cider. And yeah, she's, she's fantastic. She just comes yeah. up with incredible visuals and ideas. Yeah. She really crafting this character based on these little stories on the back of the bottle and the thing that it says up front. Mm -hmm. Speaking of cans, we have a date to can our Petite Blue. Yes, and December 11th. And our Sparkling Rosé. Our Winnipesaukee Rosé, yes. December 11th. So uh, on December 12th, you'll be able to get a can of our Sparkling Rosé. That's right, so December 12th, the Saturday, Yep. we'll have those cans. Those that come in late on Friday, we'll get them ice cold from coming off the can. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to share the, the new labels with you. They're really, they're really a lot of fun. Debs outdid herself on both of them. So, so, so the quince wine, on its own, is um, you know kind of what you expect from from smelling and eating this. It's it's um, quite dry, um, quite austere, uh, very grippy and tannic. So it's it's um, been turned into and blended with other components. To make, I'm going to start with our most distinctive wine here. This is our Lake House White, which we've made for many, many years. The first couple of, one year or two years, of Lake House White was made without quince. What do you call it? We have like white face. Is that called white? Stuff like that. Yeah. Or maybe white face was a separate one that did have quince. You have white face and you have Lake House White. And you merge the two. And then I merge the two. That's what I was uh, What you're going to soon do with these two. Hmm. Well, I have to, um, you know, clear out something when I find that there's a, a better way of putting stuff together. And we still have space on the shelves. Right. <laughs> hmm. Well, this is quite unique. I know we've had... This is my house wife before, and I said, I love this one. I drink quite a bit of this when I can. I actually, I think maybe I took to share this with you, but uh, I created some, some uh, I took, a, Gerald and I took a, a French cooking class many, many years ago, and we learned how to make French-style mussels. And I used Lake House White as the liquid in my uh, French mussels. And it was absolutely amazing. I, I dare say, might have been the best muscles I've ever had. I'm not trying to brag or anything. It's the wine that did it. It's uh, Ken gets to do the bragging on this one. It was uh, it was really outstanding. So I, I'll I share that recipe. I think we need to try that again. Have you, have you had these muscles? No, I don't know. Talking about? I think we should. Yeah, yeah I don't think I've had much. Let's make a date. Okay, let's do that. Muscles. Cheers. Muscles. The Lake House White. So in our deli. We have mm. a soup, a French onion soup, mm -hmm. which is made with our Lake House White. That's right. Oh. That, that's, I've had people say this is the best French onion so, soup I've ever had. Now you know what the secret ingredient is to what makes that French onion soup so special. Mm. Mm. So the quince is a, a smaller portion of this wine, about the same level as the rhubarb. So the prominent main constituent in this wine are peaches. And then there's a pretty big dose of rose hips, and then lesser amounts of rhubarb and quince. And it's because the rhubarb and quince are really quite strong. So what would you say the percentage of the quince is in here? I mean, that's a pretty small batch. Is this what you Yeah, that's, so that's going to be 100 liters going into 1,500 liters, so whatever that is, 8%. Okay, so it really is a small amount. It's a small amount. But that's key. It's about... It's but it's that balance, balance. Yeah. Because, because that, if you were to smell this and drink this at the same time, it would it would it would overwhelm it. Yeah. And then you know in the beginning 
I used to wait and save everything. Freeze all the peaches, freeze the rhubarb, save everything in the freezer, and then ferment them all together. As the scale grew, we had more and more people buying the wine, need to make a larger batch. Well, I didn't have enough freezers <laughs> to, to, to store everything. So now I started building it in pieces. And by building it in pieces, I get more control yeah. over the balance. Yeah. So starting in, I think in 2017, I would ferment the peaches and rhubarb because they come right about the same time. Yeah. And the rhubarb is a small amount, so I can freeze that. Again, in all these peaches, they all ferment with the rhubarb. And then the rose hips are a separate thing, because now we get more and more rose hips. Yeah, so we yeah, we can mix them at a different time. And you know what? And the smelling quince is very these, light. Smelling these side by side, I now get the quince. Yeah, you get the quince in there, right? Okay. I didn't, you know, I wasn't as, as uh, able to describe the, the nuances. You do, certainly get the peach, but there's definitely quince in there. It's yeah. really cool. It's really, you know, most people I talk to get the peach. I don't get the peach at all. I don't get any peach out of this. Hmm. I, never I, I always get the peach. Yeah, I know, you always get the peach, but I don't get the peach. Yeah. One of the things that's very unique about quince when it's turned into the straight wine, it has an aroma that, that I, that brings me back to when I was a little kid going to the tennis court with my parents because they used to play tennis all the time. You open up a fresh can of tennis balls. Yeah. There's an aroma to that. Yeah. And this quince, when it's fermented into a wine, has that aspect of it. And most people I tell that to are like, what are we yeah. talking about? But it just brings me right back really to the, you know, the public tennis courts in Northridge. I thought you were going to say they were lined with quince bushes. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. tennis ball. It was, you know, they, it was under a back. I know, that's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, that's not. I'm very familiar with it. It's in my notes. I have a you know, classic quince tennis, tennis ball can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you should try a tennis ball one. I've never fermented a tennis ball. Joe. No, no, I haven't. I see, I this is where my suggestions help Ken. This is why Ken is the winemaker. I wrote these down. You know, I, I have a Chuck and I are not. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know what's really unique that I love about this is that it's so collaborative. I mean, the cranberry cider, you you came up with that, Bob. We we brought in cranberries and cider because I was putting together our own Ipisaki Rosé. And you said, have you ever thought about just making a cranberry cider? I did. You did. Awesome. And I said, that's a good idea. So I did it. And one time I gave you a jug of part of deep blue. Mm -hmm. And you stuck it in your fridge and you went flying somewhere and you yeah. came back and you're like, Kent. Awesome. You have to play around with oxidizing this yeah. stuff because it's really good. And that became our deep blue reserve. Yeah. So there's lots of collaborative aspects to this, which I really like. But well, sometimes, you know, some of the ideas, like fermenting tennis balls, can be shuttled aside. Well, that's why you get to make the final decision. <laughs> mm. This one, with foods like this, mm. cheese and meats and crackers, it's perfect. I could just drink this all day long. Mm -hmm. Now you get the quince, don't you? Mm -hmm. now, now that you now right, that you dial in your nose, yeah, and it's a in small the, in the nose and the taste. Yeah, both of them. Mm -hmm. it, it adds that that backbone, that structure. To that's the where those tannins are. Mm -hmm. That's that drive. Yeah, that's the drive. Which is that the root bark. Yeah. This Blake House white is really really spectacular. One of the things that I think we've always struggled with early on, and still today, for those of you out there, we're talking about a wine made without grapes made with peaches and rhubarb and quince and rose hips that's bone dry. Most people don't do that. When you ferment peaches and you make a peach wine, it's expected to be a sweet wine. Right. And we thought about, when we put this on the shelf and people list the ingredients, they go, oh, that's a sweet white wine. Yeah. And they take it home, they open this up, and they're like, what is this stuff? Yeah. And then those people sure. that like a really nice dry white wine would never pick that up. So you know it's the greatest experience when we have some new folks come into the winery and they they do a flight. They they've tried three or four different wines, and I'll go out and say hello and and uh, we'll start to chat about about what they had. I'll ask them how they like their wine, and they said it's great. But where do you grow the grapes? <laughs> and and I sit very calmly and say uh, there's there's no grapes in our wine. 
And they look at me funny, like, wait, wait, wait a minute. No, no, no. You know, there's great. There's other stuff, but there's grapes, right? You, you do can't. We have to have grapes. Wine is made of grapes. Right. <laughs> and they. Uh, uh, and it's, it's just their eyes just pop out of their heads as they realize that they just had all these wines that they were sitting there drinking and enjoying and thinking were made from grapes, even though grapes aren't mentioned in any of our notes or on any of our bottles. And, and uh, because they just can't imagine that they're not made from grapes. And that's what's so wonderful about them is that they, these might be, you know, this, this drinks just like many wonderful grape wines. It's got its own unique flavors and characters, which make it special and unique. But, but it, it, it satisfies those same, uh, you know, interests that you have when you pick out a, a dry white from France or a, you know from Burgundy or something. You're, you're looking for certain characteristics in that wine, and you get them with this wine without any great. I remember going and sitting in the little cellar in the foothills of the Sierras mm. with the Gideon vine stock. Oh, that was great. And we opened up a bottle of this wine to share with them, and Clark Smith was there, and, mm. and sitting around it, he he was just enamored with the aroma. It was not like anything that he expected. Oh, these guys are coming through New Hampshire, they want to talk about fruit wine, Clark mm. said they should come and see me, I have mm. no idea what these right. people are all about. This just doesn't fit any doesn't. track yeah. at all. Mm. This is just ridiculous. Why would someone want to you know, talk to me. I, we learned stuff from him, yeah. and and he got to see what he learned. Yeah, yeah. we sat with him for three hours, and, and drank I don't know twenty five. And 25. that my old bottle of Renaissance mm -hmm. wine that he had, mm -hmm. which was just Gideon Bienstock yeah. was the uh, was a winemaker for many 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 years at Renaissance Winery, which is now defunct in California. And he since has gone off on his own and, and uh, has his own winery. What, what's the name? Of Clo Close to own in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. His wines are uh, are quite quite famous around the country. Uh, he's a very small winery. He produces about 800 cases or so a year, only from those grapes grown within his within his plot of land in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, and mostly Pinot, mostly Pinot. And you can get his wines in uh, in New in some of the fine restaurants in New York. In New York City, it's really uh, really cool. How much yeah. of this do we have? This lake has not enough, Bob. Huh? For you. Well, I would like 300 cases, please. Uh, might not. Yeah, might not well, we might not have 300 cases. cases. Yeah, so this this is very dear. Mm. It's, a lot of this is hand picked. Well, that's there's a big part of this that's really key, and I'm really. Hand picked by us, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> well, and our friends. Our friends, friends yeah. Rubar yeah. comes from yeah, our, our, our friends of the winery. Mustard Man from Steve. He, oh, really? Steve, see, yeah, he's a big supplier. He's got a big patch of, of rhubarb in his backyard. Oh, well, that's all. I get rhubarb from black, him. The black water guy? Yeah, mm -hmm. black, water, black water mustard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and uh, it used to be, we used to have our hermit shares program, where if you, if you brought us fruit that we could use in our wine, if it was fresh and organic, um, we, would, we would pay you for that fruit in shares, which then you could use to buy that wine later when it was complete. And, uh, and you used to get all kinds of fruit from lots of this is, uh, this is the 18 vintage. This has maybe one bag full of quince from somebody who lives here in America. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so they wrote so at that point, it still happens. It's just it was... a, a small part of yeah. what goes on. But that still happens. Yeah, and that's yeah. important. I mean, that's what we talk about. It's the, it's the local terroir. This is this is made made locally from, yeah. from what grows locally. Yeah, and it adds that little nuance and connection to the land and to the people. So the people that bring in that that quince, and then they come back a couple years later, here it is in, in, in the liquor. And, and this is probably the most local and organic wine that you make. It's it's hand-picked rhubarb right. from local New Hampshire farms, yep. hand-picked uh, by you guys at the beaches, the, the rose yeah, hips, the every, single, every single year. And, uh, Peaches come from a, a farm in southern New Hampshire. That's organic peaches and uh, quince. Well, this, this vintage, we used to have a sprayless uh, peach supplier. Mm -hmm. Your friend from Connecticut came up and helped us de-stone yeah. some of those peaches. Yeah, oh my god. 
back in the good old days. But this scale has gone up. This one, I think, is the first time where we went to an Amish grower in Pennsylvania okay. for the peaches. So this has gotten to be a larger scale, and it makes it more challenging for us to, to get enough years. fruit yeah. right here. Well, we had a, a peach boom and then a peach bust. That's right. Well, like peaches, the peaches, peaches yeah, in New England are they're not consistent. I mean, my, my peach trees this year were fantastic last year with just nothing. nothing. So that's a problem too. So a couple years ago, um, when I was making the quince wine to go into the Lake House White, I was also experimenting with a wine made out of tomatoes. Well, do you, you, people make wine out of tomatoes? We made a wine out of tomatoes years ago. So yes. Uh, Actually, one of the one of your early wines in 2011, when the farm down the road, Krebs, Krebs, Krebs farm, farm yep. opened up down the road from us, and Krebs was he was a, a gentleman farmer. He, he was starting a farm for the first time. He, he was in the, he retired from the insurance business, I believe, and so he he had some learning to do. And one of his first lessons was. Uh, to know how much fruit to plant based on the market. And uh, he didn't know that relative to tomatoes. And so he planted dozens of varieties oh, yeah. in, in the hundreds. It's all huge heirloom. field of heirloom yeah. tomatoes. And uh, so he came to us one day and he said, I am going to have more tomatoes than I could ever find a home for. Could you use some? And I remember Ken and I had the chance to go down to Krebs Farm and wander through the tomato fields, just grabbing tomatoes off the bushes, off the vines, and, and, and eating them right there in the field oh, and God, tasting so them. It was so delicious. Tomatoes are one of my favorite fruit. So, wow. So, yeah, so, he, so Ken handpicked <laughs> this is a very unique about a dozen, about a dozen or so, I don't know, six, no. Five different. Five, five different. Five different tomatoes. Five different. Some were those little bright orange, some yeah. sunburst or sun kissed or yeah. whatever. Some were these big, gnarly, purplish heirloom things, thin skins, and they all got mushed up to this bucket, yeah. this big thing. And so I've always wanted to return to that. And the guy who grows those wonderful peaches that we used to get peaches from, I also get his heirloom rhubarb from. He grows tomatoes. And he grows an heirloom variety of tomato called brandy wine. Hmm. And it's a thin skin, extremely aromatic, extremely high sugar, difficult to transport. These are the sorts of things you only get from farmers markets and you know, specialty stores. So he worked with me to pick them when they were peak ripeness on the vine. And then he put them into freezer bags. And frozen. And so I got all of this these tomatoes, and it was a big mass of it. I fermented that, and then I started blending. I also experimented with two different types of plum this year, and I had um, a separate batch of rhubarb wine that I made, and a separate batch of quince. So then I played around with with blending it because the tomato creates a, a strong aromatic which is, is quite unique in, in character, and not that wine-like. So by adding the quince and by adding the plum, I was able to subdue that a little bit and make it a little bit more wine-like. And the flavor, though, of the wine, I just love. It's yeah. just a little bit like a Chenin Blanc to me. Fantastic. Chenin Blanc, isn't it? Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc. Exactly. Yeah, it has that Chenin sort of character to it. Yeah. So this is our witty white. The aromas are really this. The aroma is really integrated. Yeah, better now than it was just a year ago when it was first bottled. So it has, you know, the aroma reminds me of sort of the, the uh, with the, the, some of the, some of our apple wines have this aroma, this character. It's sort of a, sort of a uh, it's not the dirty sock. Yes, yeah, dirty sock. Yeah, dirty yeah, sock. Yeah. I don't get the dirty sock. Just I get, I get a little bit of just the a subtle because I get more of the tennis ball can. Than the tomato. Uh, six months ago, I got more tomato. But so the so the aromas, it's a little off. It's 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 a little off for me, and and it, and it makes me sort of cautious as I go to drink it. Then the wine, the wine hits my yeah, mouth. I love it's the like, flavor. I oh love my it. god! It is so good. Yeah, it, it is and it's so easy once you get it in your mouth. Yeah. You know, the little little bit of off putting that aroma has. Yeah. You, you just it dissipates. Right away, behind that wonderful flavor. Yeah. 
It's so, just such a unique balance of things. Well, I know where I'm going, but there's one. And I didn't do it this year, but I'm going to do it next year, next fermentation season. Oh, that's great. There's yeah. a particular plum called an Ozark plum. And they, they had a bus this year on plums. That's the way it happened. Because yeah. I had all lined up, I was going to ferment a whole bunch of Ozark plum. And this Ozark plum, I want to do a varietal of this because it's just fantastic. It's a purple skin, um, white flesh plum with a tiny, tiny stone in it. Wow. And it makes the best damn wine wow. from a straight standpoint that I've had. Is it, and that's in here, but I only make five gallons of it. So what's, what's the uh, price of it? Is it? It's like 11 or something. 11. Like okay, yeah. so it's still I still need to add some sugar yeah. to get it up to alcohol. This is just delightful. Isn't that nice? What's the, what's the residual sugar on this? I think it's about 1%. Okay. It, it, has, a little bit it has a little sweetness to it. And, um, but it's nice. It's subtle. It's, it's still a dry wine. It's like a, it's like a medium, you know, medium dry channel to me with a, with a very unique aroma. Yeah. That's it. It has so, a mouthfeel that there should yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that's the some, of that, some, of that, some of that quince that I think gives that dry texture. Uh, yeah. And that's that's what is important in this wine. Yeah. Otherwise, it would just be a flabby wine. Your tomato wines have changed a lot in the past, too. I remember the, the first. As they age. As they age, they, they turn into something they they too. that you would never know was tomato. Right. I mean, the first one started out as a very tomato forward. Oh, it's tomato wine. Oh, well, we're right. going to do it that. It's tomato, okay. kind of thing, whatever. But then a few years later, it turned into something like a Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. It, it actually was interesting because we only did the one batch of tomato wine. And, and as you can imagine, tomato wine wasn't flying off the shelves. Most people didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> tomato wine. So we had it for a couple of years. It's so funny. We're selling wine out of your head. Right. Made out of tomatoes. <laughs> when it's a rose, well, it's a, to this everybody must have just been going, what the hell is this place? To this day, I still get people emailing me asking if we have any of that tomato wine yeah. that you made 11 years ago. Yeah, we do now. And finally, we, we were back. We made it over. We're back. Yeah. And I'm glad and we're going to keep it going. Yes, we have tomato it's, wine. You know, tomatoes this is fantastic. are a staple yeah, in New wine. England. It's really, it's really great. And I just, I'm going to figure out how to balance those things to get that aroma yeah. to more integrated with the flavor. And I think we'll, oh, you, you we'll have a hit. Yeah. You remember the uh, the Chenin Blancs in South Africa? Oh. <laughs> we gotta order our wines. We gotta order Nick. We gotta get that going. Sorry, Nick. I'm just watching. Yeah. We're we're gonna order wine. Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc in South Africa is so. Tough. I just fell in love with it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's so drinkable. Good. And and uh, maybe I'm a Yankee, but we bought Who are bottles you? of wine. Yeah, I know we're Yankee. We bought. Cases of this wine, it was. It was <laughs> then we had to bring it back halfway around the world. <laughs> but, but this really great, really coffable wine was like three dollars a bottle. Do you have any of that? Of South African wine? No. <laughs> yes. Wine? Do you do? Yeah. I, I think you say some I red. Have, I have. I have a night. I have close sarong. What? Ooh. Ooh. Wow. I didn't know that. Ah. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. To have friends. To have you friends. just jumped clear across the planet. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the second one. Gotta throw in Gideon. Yeah, well, it is sort of in the line of this the, the you know, these these conversations are we never talk about what we're gonna talk about other than the subject. And we just sit here and drink and start talking about what we're doing here, just so you know out there this isn't in any way prefabricated. So the line no of thought script. is completely different. But it's completely different to the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. The, the business. Yeah. Uh, it's consistent with our business plan. And that, but <laughs> well, I think that's the only really script we ever actually wrote. <laughs> that, that, that is, there, we do actually have a business plan script. <laughs> I remember you, you, you downloaded a structure for to this is these are things we need to fill out and all that stuff, which was smart. So we, we need to do the thing about it. But yeah, we stay true to it too. You read that plan today? Do we we'll, stay true? We'll ask them. We are we're at a different place now. <laughs> That's for sure. We passed that plan. <laughs> but the first five or six years of our business yeah. was well within the range of that plan. Yeah. No, I think it's um, for us. It keeps it alive and interesting, and it seems to be, and hopefully will continue to keep it alive and interesting for all the people out there. Yeah. The people that chime in, the people that come to our shop, the people that 
that pass our way and go, wow, I've never even heard of a quince before. And here you have a bunch of different products. It's really interesting. And right. this is changing my perspective of what a fruit wine mm -hmm. is all about. And that's been really great to, yeah. to just to see what potential is here and to work with. Yeah, that great? It's crazy good. <laughs> I I've never had this before, ever. This is this really a great experience. Yeah. It's, it's, what's really nice about this wine with tomatoes is there is a real ageable component to it where very young, it keeps a lot of tomato character. Yeah. It used to be much more vegetable. Yeah. You got much mm -hmm. more of the tomato. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you got the V8 yeah. type of thing yeah. going on. But I don't get any of that. Now it's dropping way down. I don't get any of it yeah. in this. What's interesting for you, those of you out there that are interested in, in wine making, so this is a, a, a white wine, a straw colored product. But when it starts off, all those those brandy wine tomatoes are a red tomato, mm. a big thick red tomato. It mm. looks like tomato sauce. I mean, it's just a big vat of <laughs> tomato sauce. <laughs> You're fermenting tomato sauce. Yeah, basically, yeah. Wow. yeah I mean, he's, <laughs> it ferments, and what's fascinating it works. is it yeah. ferments. I punch it down just like I do with that, and in the end, the color. And I've read about this. There's a um, That's, that's in tomatoes. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a protein. And that is part of the color. Yes. It's part in the it's skin. It's also one of the things that is supposed to be a great antioxidant and super duper right. helpful. So, which is why we're all so youthful in our ages. Is that what it is? Yes. Right. I know you are. Look at you. You know no brand yet. <laughs> <laughs> the key to my blonde hair is the lycopene from Hermit Woods Wine. <laughs> so, however, I don't think the lycopene is in here because oh, the color no. drops. And, and I've read about this and researched it to try to see. I, I want to experiment with fermenting at different temperatures to well, fix could, color. And but could the, could the lycopene and the color actually separate? separate? I don't know. Is it, could is, be. It, is it one of the same? I mean, maybe there's lycopene in there. I don't, I don't yeah. know. That's for the future when I buy my camera. Well, that, yeah. well, that <laughs> I don't actually know what's going on. <laughs> that would, that would take we know what's going on. on. Yeah. We're creating wine. <laughs> yes. We have drinkable wine. Yeah, just the think taste buds you tell it all, right? Wine. That's so we know what's happening. I mean, that's why when Melody came here from from a big, you know, hundred thousand case winery, I'm thinking about what do you don't you want to know what the pH is? I said, well, sometimes I do. <laughs> <laughs> that for most winemakers is like it's, it's what the you gold standard. Mean? But it's like Gideon. <laughs> When Gideon is out there, he doesn't know. He doesn't have a pH meter or a Briggs meter. He doesn't have sanitizer. No He's just cleaning materials, no nothing. I mean, this guy is just literally gross. He's making He's wine in the style of the 18th century wine. Yeah. yeah. Which works. When it's, when it's, when it's done. done. Clearly, Clearly it's worked. It's worked. He's drinking wine for, for thousands of years without yeah. pH meters. Right. We really have. Right. <laughs> so, so we should, uh, we're, we're on to about an hour. Ooh, yeah, we're right at an hour. Uh, we started almost on time. Wow, well, I think we're going to finish at an hour. Yeah. We were actually early today, and then we got talking about something else. Yeah. So we'll see <laughs> Happens every time. So. We've but, got Kevin Maneri is out there. Uh, oh, wonderful. Wolfgang was said something right. really nice that I have to read more. Uh, uh, JT Wilson is out there, and Geraldine's spelling Lake House Life differently. Um, Okay, yeah, so that's everybody who's out Excellent. there that we know about. Okay. Thank you guys for watching. Yeah, thanks Glad for joining us. Join us. We're, uh, Monday we'll be here again. Hey, you know what? Sooner than we know it. You know what? what? This whole thing, we're, we're out here with no audience except the audience is removed from us. We can't see them, we can't get the direct feedback. We've been talking about some ideas for the third floor of the experience and stuff. We should have things like that that go live with us three on the stage talking with this and oh, the same yeah, and everybody, and everybody people in the audience are great. there with the same food, with Absolutely. the same wines, yeah. with the same thing. So that it's not a, a scripted tasting per se, it's this, but with the group with live direct. Oh, I can't wait. That. That's going to be a blast. Let's put it on the schedule. That's going to be a blast. We're, we're, getting, we're getting close. We're, we're getting close. I, I'm told the electricians are starting tomorrow. I'm told to like on that. <laughs> <laughs>
it's, I mean, it's going to come out of the thing, but don't think it's going to happen on that day. So, good, good idea. Well, so, we could do that on Mondays and film it. We could broadcast it. Yeah, absolutely. And have, have a live studio. Have a live studio. Live studio. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have applause signs? <laughs> we want to have applause oh, signs. See? <laughs> see? We want to do this thing. All right. So everyone chime in out there. We're brainstorming this. <laughs> we're like, how do we get this? Get this perfect. It'd be so much fun. So this is where uh, this is where the, the relationships really start to blur together. So I, I get Chuck and I get to have some input on the wines that he makes. He gets the final decision, but then. That's the wonderful we thing. We put on your, you know, the marketing there, side right? of things. Ken doesn't know it. He's a, he's a closet marketer. He just doesn't know it. So, but anyway, thank you guys for joining us again. It's fun. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, I know uh, if you didn't have wine in front of you, you probably didn't. But um, but uh, please <laughs> join us. Yeah, you really missed out. <laughs> I've been bulking. Okay. Bring a bottle of wine. I'm okay with drinking wine. Bring a bottle of wine with you next Monday when you uh, when you join us. In, maybe Gerald will have some three honey. Um, maybe, maybe. maybe. <laughs> I'm quite certain. So thank you for, uh, for 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 spending our our afternoon with us again. We'll look forward to next week, and uh, we'll be in the cellar with Ken again next Monday at four o'clock. So thanks. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye.